glorious, glorious, glorious. Mm-hmm. All right, we're on, we are out of our last series that we were in, and we've let Jacob kind of rest a little. Poor Jacob, we rode him to death, didn't we? <laughs> I'm telling you, anything in your life that is right or wrong, I mentioned it before, uh, Jacob is your man. He is, just seems to... He seems to have all kind of issues going on in life and he can be used for almost anything to show what God can do with somebody. I hope after looking at about six weeks of, uh, of uh, Jacob that uh, you feel much better about your own life. Uh, you know, <laughs> Because uh, if he can, God can use Jacob, God can use anybody. Well, I wanna start today, I'm, and, and really this is just a single message. I, I, I think it is anyway. Um, I want to share with you out of John 15. Uh, John 15 uh, is, is spoken by Jesus just hours before his arrest and his trial and ultimately his crucifixion. These were words that were spoken by Jesus after he leaves the Lord's Supper with the disciples and they are walking with him out toward the Garden of Gethsemane, where in just an hour or two, he, the guards are gonna come and arrest him. And as he's walking toward the garden with his disciples, um, he begins to speak these words that are recorded in John 15. So these are some of the last words that Jesus speaks while he's here on earth. Of course, last words are always heavy. Uh, they seem to carry a lot of weight especially when you know that they're last words. And, and John 14, Jesus begins by saying, let not your hearts be troubled. So when, when a chapter begins with the words, let not your heart be troubled, you know that whatever's about to be shared is probably gonna be some pretty good stuff. And so the disciples are extremely sad. They're extremely disillusioned. I mean, even though Jesus has told them from the very beginning, I mean, right from the start, Jesus has said, guys, one of these days, they're gonna come and get me and they're gonna take me and I'm gonna be crucified, but don't worry because I'm gonna rise again and I'm gonna leave a comforter with you. And he's told them that all along, now that he said it for the last time, I'm sure they're thinking, surely not. I mean, Really, Jesus? That, that's, I mean, you're not, you're not speaking in parables about something? This is surely what's about to happen? And so at the end of chapter 14, Jesus looks at them and they're at the Last Supper together and he says, all right, arise guys, let's go from here. And they begin walking across the garden. And as they walk across the garden, Jesus must have evidently reached down and picked up a a. a, a bunch of grapes that are still growing on, on the vine. And he picked the whole vine and the whole, whole grape up, and grape, a bunch of grapes. And he, he looks at them and he says, basically, guys, do you see how this fruit is produced? I mean, do, do you see how it's growing attached to this vine and that it's the vine that they're attached to that's giving them their life and their productivity? Um, and that's how all of this stuff works in the kingdom. I've been telling you about it. This is exactly how it works. And then he begins with what's recorded in John 15 in the first verse with these words, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He's, the word is tiller of soil. It, it can be translated uh, husbandman, vine dresser. Uh, he's the farmer, he's the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. He's just saying the words that I've already said to you have pruned you already and you are now ready to produce fruit. Verse four, abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. And I I, want to add this for your understanding of that verse. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask what you desire because what you desire is what I desire. Therefore, you can ask God and he will do it for you. This is not magic. This is not just think of something on the top of your head and ask him for it and he'll do it. This is, if he abides in you, if you abide in him and his words are in you, he's going to be controlling your desires. So when you ask, you're asking him for something that's already his purpose because you're being controlled by by his own words and you can ask and it'll be done. By this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. So this is the truth of life on the vine. This is the truth of the kingdom of God. This is an analogy. This is, this is, a, this is a, 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 almost a parable about what kingdom life is all about and how God changes us from what we were when we came to him into that fruit-bearing, life-giving, God-honoring person that God created us to be. And I'd like to share with you uh, five realizations here that will change your life. Now, these used to be five or six or seven whole messages by themselves, but I'm gonna try to give them to you all in this one little sitting. And all right, don't panic. I do know there are time limits, all right? So don't panic. And you guys, don't go get your lunch now, all right? You're, they're watching. Uh, we need to, I, one of my points is this may take a while. And uh, I, I thought about getting a, a piece of construction paper and writing that over the door when you came in as a sign. This may take a while. And I started to put it on a placeholder on the screen for those guys that are watching in preparation for the service today. This may take a while. But I think I can get through it, and and I want to, because I want you to see it all at one time, because to me it makes an impact that way. These are five realizations now that will change your life. Realization number one, if you resist the monotonous, you will miss the miraculous. If I refuse, if I resist, if I reject the monotonies of life, it's going to do something bad in me. It's going to cause me to miss the miraculous. We live in a world that, of what's new and what's next. And we tend to think that, that, we, that we need to live, a, if we're going to live a life of purpose and, and a life that makes progress every day, that it's going to involve uh, new, fast-moving, uh, 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 quick things in life. And so therefore, we can get into our mind the thought that a simple little concept like consistency is not worth very much in this fast-paced world that we live in today. But the greatest catalyst for change, guys, is often found in in the most mundane routines, the most unsexy things in life. Like, is there any more mundane and routine than gardening? How many gardeners do we have here this morning? You've planted a garden. You've worked in a field. You've grown flowers. You've done anything that involves planting something. Well, you know if you have that there's nothing more routine and, 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 and mundane than gardening. What do you do? You plant a seed and then you go back the next day and 
nothing's happened. And you go back the next day and nothing's happened. Third day, nothing's happened. Fourth day, nothing's happened. Maybe on the fifth day or so, maybe if it's a fast growing kind of plant, you'll see a little sprout begin to sprout up out of the ground. I mean, it'll just be a little tiny thing. And then you'll, you'll wait another day and it's a little bit higher and then you'll try to find some stinky fertilizer to put on it. You'll put the little fertilizer on it and then you'll water it, make sure, and then it'll grow and it'll grow and you'll go back the next day. And this is just over and, and over and over and over again. This is the process. It's just a, a mundane, a routine type of process in life. But if you embrace the process, you get to enjoy the fruit. You can't have results and enjoy the reward if you don't embrace the routine. And this is not going to happen overnight. Well, that's what we want to think that, that things like these happen overnight. This is what we want to happen in life. We want these kind of things to happen overnight. We want to look at fruitful people. And we want to say about fruitful people, man, they are the luckiest people in the world. Or they found the perfect, they have a fruitful marriage, whew, they found their soulmate. As if there's magic in finding someone that you can call a soulmate. I hate to break anybody's bubble, but Tanya and I have been married for 44 years, been together uh, 47 because we were so young we couldn't get married when we, when we first fell in love with each other as teenagers. And I can just tell you right now, I believe I have found my soulmate. <laughs> if I haven't, it's too late now. <laughs> but I can tell you another thing. Just because I have found my soulmate doesn't mean that we both haven't had to work at this thing all through these years. There is no magic in finding some person that you don't have to work with in any way in order to have a great life that everything that is miraculous seeming in life, no matter what area you're talking about, there are no overnight successes in business. There are no overnight successes in sports figures. Sure, they can run fast, they can hit hard, they can jump high, but they have to practice that stuff all the time. They have to learn how to do it. It's over and over, mundane, repetitive, routine, routine. Medicine's the same way. Technology's the same way. There are no overnight successes because fruitfulness is a process. And you can't separate fruitfulness from faithfulness. Here in John 15, Jesus continues and says, uh, when you think about me, guys, I want you to think about a vine. Just a little information about a vine now. I don't want to insult anybody, but just so you'll know, the vine is not that part that runs up on the arbors and runs on the window sills. That's not the vine. Those are the branches. The vine is that stump looking deal that's down there on the ground that has the roots that are going down in the ground and collecting all the nutrition. That, that is the root. So Jesus is saying, guys, I am the part that's rooted down in the ground. I'm that, I'm that unsexy looking, stump looking thing that's down in the ground that's bringing life up into this vine and you are the branches that are attached to the vine and if you will stay attached to me, then you're gonna be able to produce fruit. And the apostle Paul tells us what kind of fruit in Galatians 5 when he says, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, or self-control. That's the kind of fruit that we're talking about bearing in life. And Jesus says, you know, even, and that's why I asked them to sing Waymaker, even, even if you don't see it, I'm working. Even if you don't feel it, I'm working. I never stop working because it's my job to keep life flowing firmly from, uh, from me to you so that if you will stay attached to me, that you are going to produce fruit. Verse one, I am the true vine and my father is the genie. Wait, wait, wait. I wrote that down wrong. It said, 
doesn't say. Well, that's what we want it to say, right? Hey, you know, I don't think most of us want a gardener God, do we? We would really much prefer a, a genie God. But Jesus, when he said, you know, uh, what analogy can I choose that would describe this best? Out of all of the analogies in the world that Jesus could have chosen to describe what the kingdom of God is about and what life, what, what our lives are about in relationship to him and, and what he's going to do all of our life, Jesus says, okay, think of God as a gardener. But I don't want a gardener, God. I want one of these cute little bobblehead Jesus that you can hang up, put on your dash and rub his head and get that good mojo and that God look going on. That's what I want. I don't want a gardener, God. I want to be able to pray one time and something will happen. I want to be able to go in and hear one sermon and it changes my whole life and give $5 and poof, miracles start happening. That's what I want. We don't, <laughs> we don't, want, to, we don't want to work like that and we don't think God should expect us to work. No. If you expect something to happen miraculously and then you blame God because it doesn't happen miraculously, this doesn't work. No, you're not working it. Things don't happen that way. God, Jesus said, I'm a vine and you're the branches. So if you resist the monotonous, you are going to miss the miraculous. Is, is that true? Is, is that true? Is there anything in the Bible that says something like that? Well, what about, um, what about Joshua's life? In Joshua, you remember, God used Moses to bring Israel out of Egypt and they walked around the desert for 40 years out there. And finally Moses dies and God says, Moses, my servant is dead and I'm glad because now we, I can send you into the promised land. And so Joshua takes them into the promised land after 40 years of wandering around in the desert. And the first order of the day when Joshua gets them into the promised land is Jericho. Jericho's not a big city, but Jericho does have big walls. Sometimes things are not as big as they seem when you get God's perspective about things. So God says, all right, you're going to have to conquer Jericho. It's the first city it was the most difficult city, not because it was the largest, but because it had the highest walls. Oh, it was almost impenetrable. You know, most things, most of the time, it's that first step that's the hardest anyway, right? The first, I mean, the first step, you know, that's the most difficult one to take in almost any venture, all right? Joshua 6, here it is. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the Ark of the Lord, which is the Ark of the Covenant. Then seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets and the armed men went before them, but the rear guard came after the Ark of the Lord while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Bunch of sevens in there, which are all symbolic of perfection and I don't want to get into all that. Verse 14 and the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to camp. So they did six days. Six days. Six days, they get out there, they walk around the city one time, preachers out blowing the trumpets in front of the ark, preachers behind the ark blowing trumpets, all the children of Israel walking around behind the ark, all the way around the city one time, and then they go back to camp. Next day, one time, go back to camp. Next day, one time, go back to camp. Can you imagine all of the ridicule and harassment that Israel is receiving now from the citizens of Jericho? Can you imagine them sitting on the walls up there, cackling at them, throwing eggs at them, uh, you know, insults? What are you doing, you bunch of Jews? You're weak, weak, yeah. Yeah, why don't you, you're walking around. What do you think, the walls are gonna fall down or something? On yeah, yeah, go back to your camp, you idiots, you know. And I'm sure that Israel probably started feeling pretty foolish themselves. They're probably all looking around saying, 
Are you sure you heard right, Joshua? You get us out here? We thought Moses was crazy, but now you're taking the cake, buddy. I mean, we're out here walking around one time, two times, and, and, and nothing's happened. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only, they marched around the city seven times. Uh, I, did I put a, yeah, I put a line under, in the same manner and on that day. They didn't do it any differently than they did the other days. They did it in the same manner and on that day. Listen, you, you never know when that day is going to happen, right? You, you got to do what, what you're supposed to do because you never know. It might be that day. This might be that day. And they marched around there seven times, and the seventh time it happened when the priest blew the trumpets that Joshua said to the people, shout for the Lord has given you the city. You have to keep investing even though it may not appear that it is working. You can't read your Bible for two weeks and say, this stuff doesn't work. Look at your neighbor and say, don't quit. You can't pray, you can't come into church and come down and pray one prayer at this altar and, 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 and think that that's going to solve everything in your life. You can't quit because that one little thing doesn't happen. I mean, you can't put $5 in the offering plate and then next week you don't become rich so you think God's lied to you about returning to you a hundredfold and all of these kind of things. These things are routine and they're mundane. And here's the key to change is more of the same. More of the same. Second realization. Repeat the right things until the routine becomes the reward. Yeah, it does matter what you do, but you got to do the right things in the right ways. And if you do the right things in the right ways, then the routine is going to become the reward. Look at verse four. Jesus says, abide. This is, one of the, this is when he starts talking about abide, and he uses this word seven times in eight verses. You know what the word abide means? Remain. Hang in there. Don't leave. Remain with me. Abide with me. In me and I in you, as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. So Jesus is saying, you know what produces fruit in your life? Remaining with me. That's what produces fruit in your life. There's no trick to it. There's no magic to it. If you remain with me, if you stick with me, you are going to produce fruit. Fruit in life. One of the most deflating mindsets to bearing fruit is the notion that reward is based purely on results. And that the only sense of growth you will have will come from the accomplishment of the goal. And the accomplishment of the goal is based on the end results that are accomplished. It's as if the routine, what I do to try to accomplish something doesn't mean anything. It's just a means to an end. All that really matters is the end. But it's the routine that Jesus is pointing to. It's the remain, it's the abide, it's the hang on, it's, the, it, 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 it's not the get to the end so you can get the reward at the end, it's the whole process that Jesus is talking about. But in order, in order to, to receive the reward, you have to do the right things and you have to do them the right way. When Justin was born, he's our firstborn son, and, and as he grew up, uh, he got to be about four years old, and he wanted to play t-ball. All right, so I mean, I know many of you parents have been through t-ball and all that kind of stuff. Well, we started as a four-year-old with t-ball, and I started teaching him how to swing the bat, the proper balance, mechanics, so forth. I started teaching him how to catch the ball and how to throw so that 
that he could throw straight and he could have a good arm and all those things. As a four-year-old, I started teaching him that. Well, it took a long time, as it would with any four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old, we played. And for many years, and I know this is gonna sound terrible, but for many years, I'm talking three, four, five years, I would not let him practice without me. And I know you're probably thinking, well, why, Pastor? Don't you know practice makes perfect? No, practice doesn't make perfect. You know what practice makes? Practice makes permanent. And if you're not doing it the right way, you are going to groove yourself permanently doing it wrong. And you may never get out of it. Have you ever watched anybody... Uh, some network anchor or somebody uh, in some kind of little uh, game they're playing or something and they're gonna, oh yeah, we're gonna swing the bat. And have you ever seen somebody that you could tell by the way they swung that bat, they've never swung a bat in their entire life? How goofy and awkward and, you know, uh, how, how to, out of whack or somebody swinging at a golf ball that's never swung a golf club in their life? Why? Because you not only have to do the right thing, you got to do the right thing in the right way in order to bear fruit and to produce like Jesus wants us to produce. So when we give, we don't just give. We give with a cheerful heart, with a cheerful attitude. Because look, the purpose of giving is not just the end result that some money goes into an offering plate. The purpose for giving is that your heart would be released with, the, with enthusiasm to know that God has blessed you with what you're about to give up here. So you, it's, it's the routine, it's the process that makes a, that makes a difference in, in what happens in life. I've shared with you this one little illustration and um, a, a bunch of times, so I'm just gonna flash through it. When I was 25, my doctor told me, uh, you need to start working out. I'm 25, I feel flat, lackluster, blah. He says, you ever exercise? I said, yeah, I get out in the yard and play with my children. He said, no. He said, do you, you, for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes, do you get your heart rate up? I said, no, not on purpose. And um, he said, well, you, I think if you'd do that, um, it would help you. So I started doing it at 25. I developed a, a routine. Um, I worked out and I started lifting weights. And the first 10 years, uh, I lifted with my brother who I'm the oldest, and of course, I always had to outdo my brother. And uh, so we did all kind of junky stuff and setting goals about how much we're gonna lift and blah, blah, blah. After 10 years, I started working out with two other guys. One of them was a bodybuilder and one of them was a power lifter. And um, needless to say, <laughs> I had a little trouble, <laughs> a little trouble keeping up. And um, I, was, I was on the squat rack, and for all you guys that don't know, it's a bar across you and you got a rack to keep you from killing yourself, hopefully. You put big weights out here and you go down and you come back up. That's a squat. Well, obviously, the more weights you put on, the worse it is. Well, I was on the squat rack and I had a bunch of weights on there. It doesn't matter. I'm not trying to brag. Uh, but it was a bunch of weight. And I, got, I had my knees wrapped up, had my big belt around my waist, had my elbows wrapped up. And I'm going down. I got down right in here and I started coming up like this. And it dawned on me. I had what's called an epiphany. That's one of those, ding, you idiot, um, moments in life. And, and, and the voice inside me said, what are you doing? <laughs> Look at yourself. I said, I started kind of, I got back up, put the bar on the rack, and I started looking. My knees wrapped, waist wrapped, elbows wrapped. Keep me from hurting myself. I was lifting such heavy weight, if I got a little off balance, a little off kilter, I might blow a knee out or an elbow. I might hurt my back and I can't even walk anymore, much less do anything. And here's what came through to me. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to become a weightlifter? Are you trying to become an Olympic athlete or something like that? No, I'm just trying to stay in shape so I can have a nice life as I get older, and it dawned on me, then you need to develop a routine that you can work with for the rest of your life, where the 
goal is not how much can I lift so I can take a picture and put it on my counter behind my desk to show everybody that I lifted a whole bunch of weight. The purpose is to keep in shape, and if you hurt yourself, you can't do it anymore, and you're not going to be able to keep in shape. That's the routine itself becoming the reward. Coming to church is a reward in itself. You say, well, that message really, really didn't say a lot to me today. Well, you were here, right? There was a purpose for you being here, and it may not have had anything to do with what I was going to preach about, or that they didn't sing your favorite song, or somebody didn't do some whatever it might be. I mean, coming to church is a routine that is often mundane and is often routine, but it in itself is the reward for the practice of that in life. You can't read your Bible just when you feel like reading your Bible. You have to read your Bible sometimes when you feel like watching TV. Why? Because it's the routine of this that actually becomes the reward. You have to practice this stuff. One of, one, one of, one of the greatest attributes of God is that he is faithful. Do you know what the writer of Hebrews says about God? In Hebrews 13, I, I don't think I have it on the, on the slide, Tim. He says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's one of the reasons we love him so much because he's always the same. He doesn't change. It's the routine that is the actual reward. <laughs> Not the result, it's the routine. All right, here's the third realization. To change your life, you must change your pattern. Oh, this is a good one. To change your life, you must change your pattern. John 15, first two verses. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up. By the way, that's the Greek word, iro, and I know many Bibles doesn't, don't say, they don't say that. They say he takes away, um, which doesn't make a bit of sense in that verse. It doesn't go there. It's not the right translation of that word. The word iro most often, way most often, means to lift up or to take up. It does not mean take away. If it meant take away, what that verse would be saying is, if you're a Christian and you don't bear fruit, God's going to take you away and throw you in the fire. And that's not how God works. Nothing in the Bible teaches us that. What that verse is saying is, if, you're, if you belong to Jesus and you're not producing fruit, you're laying on the ground, you got a problem. You know what your problem is? You don't know what you are. You think you're a root. You're a branch. So you're trying to root, you're trying to grow some roots down there on that ground. So what Jesus does is he lifts you up off the ground and fixes you on the trellis where you belong so you can start being a branch and not trying to be a root anymore. That's how much God loves you. He doesn't just snip you off and throw you in the fire. He, if you're not producing fruit, there's a reason you're not producing fruit. And he lifts you up off that ground and puts you on that trellis. But if you are bearing fruit, notice what it says. If you are bearing fruit, what's he going to do to you? Snip, snip. Everybody say, snip, snip. It's the soundtrack of life. All right, here we are. If you are bearing fruit, he's going to prune you so that you can bear more fruit. And guess what happens? Jesus starts describing a process. And his description of this process gives us the answer as to the purpose for pain in our lives. Jesus said, if you abide in me, your pain is not pointless. In other words, you get pruned. All right, you're abiding in him. You're producing fruit. You got the fruit. It's hanging all over you. All right, the fruit... Take the fruit off, all right? We want you to produce some more fruit. So what are we going to do? We're going to snip, 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 
so that you can grow some new branches that will have more fruit than ever on them. And then you're going to produce that fruit, and then it's going to be gathered, and then what are we going to do? Snip, snip, produce some more fruit. The process of our life is produce, prune, produce, prune, <laughs> produce, prune. All of our life, that is the pattern of growth in the kingdom of God. And so the snipping is never delightful. The pruning is always painful, guys. It, it always is, no matter what God uses to prune our lives. I mean, if he pulled out some heavenly shears and just snip, 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 he could do that if he wants to, but most of the time, he uses other snips to snip us. But remember, uh, the snips are in his hands, okay? So no matter how we get snipped, he's the one snipping. You just got to keep that in mind. Circumstances, emotional challenges, uh, God's correction, seasons of waiting, you know? There are all kinds of ways God prunes our lives so that we can bear more fruit. But ultimately, the pattern is produce, prune, produce, prune, produce, prune. How many of you have ever said, I can't ever catch a break? Every time, every time I get through with something, man, it just seems like something happens and here I go again. I mean, that's the process of God. That is the pattern of God working in your life. And if you stay attached to him, all of that pain has a point to it. And the point is you're going to grow more fruit because Jesus wants to grow fruit in us and as he does, we experience a spiritual pattern of pain. We're produced and then we're, we're pruned. Here, here, it, it, it's a real test, guys. It's a, it, I mean, really, it's a real trial. That's why in the book of James, James had to say this to us. It's not on the slide. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith creates patience. And let patience have her maturing work in you so that you can be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. I want you to grow up to be a big boy that can take care of themselves, that doesn't fall apart at every little thing in life, that has some answers for people, that can have some compassion and can soothe some things and know a few things that might be able to lift somebody else up out of ground. But you can't get it if you don't go through the pattern. So when you're in the pattern, look at God and say, thank you, Lord. This is exactly what I needed. Because if you want to change your life, if you want to change the product you got to change the pattern in life. Romans, Paul said in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, to God, which is your reasonable service. Verse two, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and that acceptable and perfect will of God. The problem revealed here is not the world. For God so loved the world. God loved the world so much he sent Jesus. The problem is not the world. The problem that Paul reveals is the pattern of the world. He says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. This world has a pattern. This world thinks a certain way. It acts a certain way. It desires certain things. And so Paul is warning us, look, if you follow the pattern of this world, you are always going to be pursuing power and fame and lust and uh, money. I mean, that's going to be the constant call of your life. Why? Because that's the pattern of the world. This is the way the world thinks. And I know, look, many of us, many of us came from crazy, abusive uh, addicted families. And we, and we had to fight the same devils that our father fought, that our grandfather fought, that our great-grandfather fought. What was the problem with our families? We had some bad patterns in there. All right, let's use just a little math to see it. Is everybody up for just a tiny scratch of math? Put a little math problem up here on the board, baby. There we go. All right, I know that looks kind of confusing, but... 
I'm not a mathematician, but I just want to use you because you just see things so easily with patterns and so forth. You know math is all about patterns, right? That's what math is. It's just patterns. Well, all right, here we got a problem up at the top. Six times 111. All right, that six times 111 represents a pattern. It means I can have six 111s or I can have 111 sixes. And they're going to equal the product is 666. All right, I don't like 666. That's a number that I'm not comfortable with. I don't like it. So I want to change my product. How do I change my product? In, in order to change my product, I have to change my, Holly said it, I think, my pattern. If I want to get a different answer, I got to ch change my pattern. So I change the six to a seven, and now the pattern is seven 111s or 111 sevens, and it gets to be seven, 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 a, a number that I'm much more comfortable with. So if you don't like the product, you have to change the pattern. Some of us don't like the product of our life. We don't like the way we look. We don't like the way we think. We don't like the way we feel. That's the product of our life. So you can stare at it. You can speak against it. You can pray against it. You can cast it out. You can shout at it. You can get it by the ear and yell in its ear. And it doesn't make one bit of difference. Because it doesn't care. If you want to change the way your life is, you have to change your pattern. Because the problem is not the product. The problem is the pattern. Let's see how this looks in real life, just for a second. We'll have just a second of fun with you. All right. All right, I'm, I'm still good, I think. All right. We all want to blame God for the fact that we don't have any friends. But the Bible says, if a man would have friends, he must show himself friendly. So if I want more friends, what's required? I've got to be friendlier in life. If I want to change my product, I got to change my pattern. If you don't like the way your children act, what do you do with that? Well, I, how about a little more consistent discipline? How about a little encouragement? How about a little instruction? How about paying attention to what's going on with them? If you don't like the product, then you got to change the pattern. You don't like the way your career's going, all right? Change your work ethic. Get some education. Learn how to do something else. Increase your skills. Find somebody to apprentice under. I mean, if you don't like the product, change the pattern of your life. If you don't like the outcome, then change the input. You got to pay attention to the patterns of your life. You got to study the patterns of your life in order to change the product. Ecclesiastes, I mean, um, Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul says, this world's so crazy and so messed up, you're going to need, I think I put it on the slide, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. That word is Greek methodia, which means methods or schemes. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Did you know that the devil has schemes against you? Do you know this? Do you know that the devil doesn't just go up and say, hey, look what he's doing. Oh, yeah, well, I think we can mess him up. No, he has schemes. He has methods. He has plans. He studies you. Well, he doesn't, but his demons do. They study you. They see your tendencies. They see your weaknesses. They see the choices that you make, what you're most likely to want, what motivates you, what moves you. They, and they scheme against you. So in this area of patterns, let me, let me just sh show you about this. In this area of patterns, what they do is they devise a scheme to convince you that whatever pattern you're living that's not producing what you want, you're stuck in it. You can't change that pattern. That's ridiculous to think. You've lived that way all of your life. This is your permanent description. This is you. This is your personality. This is a, like what? Like, like, I hear people say it all the time. I'm not a morning person. What, is that your personality? I mean, I mean like, a, I'm not a morning person. 
I hate mornings. Well, is that really true? Is that really what I am? I hate mornings. I'm a morning hater. Or can I be changed? Well, let's examine the pattern. All right, here's our pattern. Stay up late at night. I got to binge watch one more episode of uh, Dawson's Creek or whatever it is. When I get through with that, I got to check Facebook, Twitter, TikTok before I go to bed. So it's well after midnight before I go to bed. When I get in bed, my head hits a pillow. I replay all the stressful events of the day. I worry about everything. Don't pray about anything. I blow up at the kids just for good, just for good luck at midnight. Get my adrenaline all pumped up and, and, and fired up. Uh, I drink two glasses of soda before I go to bed, so I've got loads of caffeine and, full, and a full bladder. And I don't lay out my clothes in the night before, so when I get up, everything that I want to wear is dirty and I can't find it, so I hate mornings. I'm not a morning person. No, you just have bad nighttime patterns. Change your pattern. You'll change your product. Let's do another one. You want to do another one? I'm a bad student. I've heard that. I'm a bad student. I just hate school. Really? That's your personality? <laughs> I'm a bad student? Let's just examine your pattern. You go to bed. Of course you don't lay any clothes out before you go to bed. That would take far too much time. You hit the snooze alarm four times before someone has to yell you out of bed. Breakfast is out of the question. You can't find your homework. I'm sure the dog ate, ate it. You miss the bus, so you have to go next door and beg your grouchy neighbor to take you to school. Oh, yeah, you're tardy, and you spend the first two periods of the day sitting in the principal's office trying to get a pass to get back in class. You finally get to class and everybody's looking at you, so you have to act like a clown so everybody will think you're cool. You don't know what happened in the classes before you got there, and you don't know what homework they gave in the classes that you missed. You file your fingernails, you tweet your followers, you troll Facebook, and you listen to your music all while trying to study history, write a paper, do math, and prepare for exams that are starting tomorrow. So I'm a bad student. School's not for me. No, you just have bad life patterns and poor study skills. And by the way, multitasking is just another name for being distracted. My life's hectic. No, you procrastinate and then you have to hurry everywhere you go. Hurry and procrastinate are your patterns and hectic is your product. I'm so disorganized. No, you're lazy haphazard and you refuse to focus. Lazy is your pattern and disorganized is your product. In a nutshell, we interpret our decisions as if our decisions uh, control our destiny. But the truth is, our decisions do not control our destiny. Our decisions create our patterns. Our patterns control our destiny. Ooh, I hear you. I, hear you. Ooh, I'm, I believe it, Pastor, but man, the devil is always attacking me, I'm telling you. You know, we just give him far too much credit. It, he's probably not a thousand miles from there. It's your patterns that are messing you up. Now, I'm not saying that there's not a devil. There is a devil. There actually is a real devil, and we have to really fight and war against him. But you want me to show you where his headquarters is? Right here. That's his headquarters, right there. And if you want to change your product, you change your pattern. Realization number four, I'm just going to say it, and in five, I'm going to quit. This may take a while. Realization number four is this may take a while. You can't, you can't defeat 20 years of... Uh, of a bad pattern in two days. You can't put back a 15-year failing marriage in five days. This may take a while. The patterns that you've established over your lifetime may take a while. You got to commit. That's why he says abide, remain, abide, 
attached to the vine, abide. <laughs> this is a process. Jesus, it, look, John 15 says that Jesus is a vine, not a vending machine. You don't push, pull, click, click, and get fixed that, that quick. It sometimes takes a while. So you have to be in for the long haul. All right, a, a while is not easy for us to deal with, is it really? That little phrase, a while, because it has no, uh, uh, it has no uh, boundaries, right? We don't know how long is a while. Well, I mean, the Bible says that uh, 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 a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. So I, I'm, I'm really not thinking I want to trust God's uh, definition of a while, right? Because if a while means 15 minutes, man, I'm good. If it means 15 years, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> count me out of that. Because it's hard to um, stay for the duration when you don't know how long the duration is going to be. There's no limits. It's just a while. This may take a while. So you got to hang in there with him, and, 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 uh, and ta it takes a while. All right, here's the last one. Last reality, your success is only as sustainable as your source. Your success is only as sustainable as your source. Let me read a few verses out of John 15. Verse four, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. Now I'm gonna skip down to verse 16, which we've not read, but I want you to see it. You did not choose me, Jesus said, but I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. So Jesus is not talking about some little temporary results that vanish very quickly. He's talking about permanent, permanent fruit in our life. So how do I have sustainable success? Well, it depends on my source. I mean, isn't that what Jesus is saying in all these verses, that no fruit is better than the vine that, it's, that produced it? So I'm not going to be any more successful than whatever it is that I'm attached to and whatever sustains me. Like if, if it's people's opinion that is my source, then as soon as, hey, when their opinion is good, I'm fine. When it goes bad, uh-oh, I fall. And opinion is fickle, remember that. So if, if, if I'm no better than my source, if my source is people's opinion, I'm gonna be up and down like a yo-yo. Or if it's popularity, as long as I'm popular, great. But you know, when I become unpopular, boom, there I go. Remember Jesus said, and I started to underline the word, Jesus said he was the true vine. True vine, that's what he said. I am the true vine. I thought, why would he say that? Well, there must be a fake vine somewhere. <laughs> yeah, right. If he said, I'm the true vine, it implies that there's a fake vine. And if I attach myself to this fake vine, which could be popularity or, or uh, opinion or an image I create of myself or my own strength or any of another, uh, any of, of a number of fake vines that I could attach myself to, then I'm not going to be successful. You say, what did I say? What are you attached to? A couple of things in connection with that. Uh, you need a constant and I'm, I don't, I'm not going to get all off into that. But a constant is something that's always there. In a math problem, 5x plus 1 equals 11. x is the variable, 1 is the constant. 1 is always 1 no matter what x is. It's always constant. What is your constant? You have a constant. What is your constant? God's my constant. No, let's get a little more specific than that. I mean, God's all our constant, Right? What, 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 what are we talking about when we say God is my constant? All right, what about his word? That means no matter what, my constant is I'm reading his word. 
I'm studying his word. I'm trusting his word. That means when I feel like it and when I don't, when I want to, when I'd rather be doing other stuff, that's gonna be a constant in my life and that keeps me hooked to the right source. Yep. And what about uh, other fruit on the vine that uh, is just like you? Uh, some camaraderie, some, some, some partnership. What about the people you hang with and the people you call your friends and stuff like that? I mean, that's important. Those are, those are constants in your life that change you and affect you. You know what you're hungry for most of the time? What everybody around you is hungry for. And when they say, let's do this, you say, yeah, it sounds great to me. Let's do it. Make sure they're heading in the right direction. My constant is God. Okay. All right. Hopefully you got all that. Did y'all get all of that? Do I need to go over it again? <laughs> all right. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads. Let's...